good time, but when I got to bed, I don't remember my head ever hit the pillow. I, I, don't, I don't remember it either. You will have to. Oh, oh no. You will it have to. It was very successful auction. We took in $4,200 yesterday, so I appreciate that. Now we can set it down here. Well, you should be get somebody to do it for me, I'm going to need to be out there. Yeah, well, to then you'll have to find somebody to I can do it for you. Okay, great, great. Uh, that will help offer some of the I don't expenses think. of this fight. Let me see here. Hold on. If you try to up it a little bit uh, this year, if you could, and uh, you'll bring in some With, you would, more speakers. It worked. And all that now, is you'll have a little bit the, more. Uh, but... Uh, you uh, have the pointer, to me. but you uh, won't have the okay, I got a pointer. That's not working. Yeah, I won't have the ability. And, uh, uh, I had a good time. All right, so. Uh, okay, good. Now, what you could do is. There you go. At this moment, so that's good. in time, I'd like to okay. introduce Gene Crocker. Everybody knows who Gene Crocker I need a microphone. Backbone of Carter Hall. We need to get my program on there, too. He still spends a few hours here every week. And he's been, he's been a lecturer for the last 20 years, probably. Uh, going to societies all over the country, doing the breeding for Carter and Holmes. Uh, and I've known Gene ever since he started at Carter and Holmes, because I was doing business with him before he got there. That's 29 years ago. <laughs> But anyway, we were both real young. 29 years later, he's bald headed up here. Yeah. Uh, I've got a big stomach, and uh, I got my black suit ready to go. So, uh, oh, anyway, we're uh, going to have a good time today. We're going to listen to Gene. And uh, Gene's going to be talking on uh, Catleys of the Indies, I believe it was. Right. It's okay. the easy set of key right there. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Gene Crocker. Gene. Good morning. Thank you, John. It's my pleasure to be with you. But my voice will run out if I have to uh, project this much all for the program, so I'm going to have a microphone on. We're getting it set up right now. No, it's, it's not coming up. It's not coming up? There, there it is. Okay, which uh, one are we going to put yeah, up there, sir? Uh, the first one. Catalias of the Andes. Yeah. Okay. We're a little late getting set up because Keith Davis was up here taking my time. <laughs> <laughs> but I volunteered to help him with his program later. I think you'll have a treat today. I think uh, you'll enjoy this. Uh, this month... 59 years ago is when I bought my first two orchid plants. Actually, my parents bought them for me. I was 15 years old. We were visiting in St. Uh, Petersburg, and I found out about Earl's small orchids. And I'd been growing all kinds of plants, but I wanted to try some orchids, and so uh, I talked them into taking me there. If they'd known what they were getting into, they probably would not have. <laughs> but uh, Bob Livingston was the grower there, and uh, wonderful wonderful gentleman and a great orchid person and so he took me under his wing and helped me pick out two plants. They were Cattleya seedlings, three dollars each <laughs> and uh, and so I took them back to South Carolina and grew them up and bloomed them and really had a great... Uh, Don't mind me. You can continue. I'm going to cut the volume down myself. Maybe my battery ran out on that. That's a, you were walking a little slow. You can put that in your pocket. Put that on my collar. Put it on this collar. Okay, that's good. Go ahead and try that and see what happens. Okay. Uh, that way I don't have to shout. I think y'all can hear me better. Um, anyway. I grew up in South Carolina, and I lived, growing up, about 40 miles from Carter and Holmes. And so I didn't know about Carter and Holmes orchids when I got those first two plants. But as soon as I got back home with them and I told people I had some orchids, they said, well, there's a nursery down in Newberry. And back then, we got our driver's license when we were 14. 
So I started, uh, uh, I went to uh, the nursery there and, uh, and found and met Bill Carter. And again, Bill Carter took me under his wing. And through the years, I would freak, visit frequently. He and Barry Ellen both worked in the greenhouse, but they had a woman, they had a, Pauline was their cook. And she'd been cooking for Bill prior to him getting married, and so she stayed on and cooked for them. <clears throat> and so they would invite me to have lunch with them. <clears throat> and uh, I couldn't wait to eat some of Pauline's cooking. It was worth going down there for that. <clears throat> so I thoroughly enjoyed knowing them, but uh, I did not go into the orchid business. I, I, I went into the Air Force after college. <clears throat> my father took care of my plants for me. And then, uh, there you go. Uh, and then after college, uh, I went into the Air Force. And, and, and then when I got out of the Air Force, <clears throat> excuse me, this will clear up. When I got out of the Air Force, uh, I went to work in North Carolina. And I joined the North Carolina Orchid Society and two of the people I met were Mary and Henry Fuller. They lived in South Carolina and they had a commercial orchid nursery. They sold cut flowers uh, in the Raleigh area. And Jeff, I was uh, telling uh, some people this morning, Cliftonii Magnifica you showed in your program. And, uh, huh? Cliftonii. All right, Cliftonii. <laughs> Cliftonii Magnifica. Is they had a whole bench of that, a whole bench. And I asked Kitty's uncle, I said, why do you have so much of that? And he said, I don't sell that. He said, I keep it. He said that uh, if it ever flowered for Easter, or when it flowered for Easter, that the blooms off of that one group paid the fuel bill for the whole year. Mm. And, but, you know, Easter varies, and Cliftonia, Cliftonia was, was not as, uh, uh, throughout the program, uh, these corrections, hold them till the end of the program. <laughs> there you go, Gene. <laughs> he can't write, though. Yeah. He can only talk. Anyway, I was out in the greenhouse with Uncle Henry, and uh, Kitty's Aunt Mary came out there, and she said, y'all come in the house. There's some girls here I want Gene to meet. Uh, and uh, Uncle Henry said, he didn't come to meet any girls. He came to, uh, to uh, see the orchids. And then she said, well, I've got some cold Pepsi and some cookies. And I said, well, I am kind of thirsty because I want to check out the girls. <laughs> and, and so Kitty was there. She'd been water skiing, and uh, she looked like she was a, a middle school student. But it turns out she was a rising senior at the University of South Carolina. She was a lot older than she looked. And so she was within my range. Our first date was to the South Carolina Orchid Society show in Columbia, South Carolina. Oh. Yeah. Oh. But it took place at the state fair, so, uh, and she must have liked me right away because she rode rides at the fair that uh, she wouldn't dare get on any other time in her life, but uh, for that first date, she did. So anyway, it's been a happy life. We've been married 46 years and have three children, and uh, everybody's done well. Orchids were a hobby for me for 30 years, and then uh, I worked in the textile industry, and uh, about 30 years ago, the textile industry uh, pretty much disappeared in the South, uh, got exported into other countries, and uh, for, for crafted in pride in the USA is what their motto was, but, but uh, sometimes you can find American fabrics, and, and I worked for Cannon Mills. We made sheets and towels. I worked there for uh, that period of time, for 20 years, and uh, then they started, they were bought out. And it became an uncomfortable place to work, and uh, actually they were bought out again, but I'd already left by then. But uh, I started looking around, and I, I talked to Owen Holmes. I was going to open a garden center and have a greenhouse and grow orchids and other tropical plants, too. I talked to Owen Holmes about it, and he said, I want to talk to you, but I want you to come and work for us because just previous to that, two weeks before that, the head grower had announced that he was leaving and uh, he was moving to Florida. So uh, they needed somebody and it was a big move at that time, but uh, we made the move and uh, so that was 29 years ago, 80, 1986. 
And uh, that's when I first met John. Now, my first orchids I got 59 years ago. And shortly after that, uh, I was in the Air Force, and that's when I met Joe Grizzoffi. And uh, so I've known Joe for 51 years. Um, I have a program I do on unusual orchids I have known. And I always tell people that someday I'm going to do a program on unusual orchid growers I have known. <laughs> now, yeah, I, I don't mean to imply that uh, John Odom and that uh, Joe Grizzoffi were would be part of that program. But anyway, uh, I have to outlive uh, a number of people in this room in order to be able to do that program. So. <laughs> Well, we're going to get started. Uh, the program I'm going to do is Catlias of the Andes. Uh, we all know that the Andes are in South America. Uh, you'll learn a little more about them in a minute. But you see there under the title it says, With One Exception. And because I wanted to start this. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a pointer now, but I doubt that I'll be using it much. Uh, let me see here what I do to change this. There we go. Uh, this is the one exception, Catley Labiata from Brazil. I had to include this because it's the founding genus of Catleus. It was discovered in around 19, 1818. The story is that this Professor Swainson was gathering mosses and lichens in Brazil and he saw these thick leaved plants and these were going back to Europe on board ship and he wanted to protect his mosses so he he wrapped the bundles with these thick leaf plants. Uh, and when they got back to Europe, uh, they took off those, those plants and took his collection out. And um, William Catley, who was a hobbyist grower, saw those plants and recognized that it was some type of orchid. So he asked if he could take them to his greenhouse and, um, and grow them and maybe flower them. And it was a couple of years before the first one bloomed, but it created a sensation. It was the first large flowered cattleya that had ever been seen in Europe. And uh, Lindley uh, named the genus for William Cattleya. It's Cattleya. Uh, a lot of our customers come in and say Cattleyas, and you know they call them everything. But anyway, remember it's named for William Cattleya, and you you'll know how to pronounce it. But um, and then they went back to Brazil, and for a long time they couldn't find the uh, labiatas. They found others, other catlias in the meantime. But uh, these are a couple of uh, labiatas, some of the uh, semi alba on this side, and the one over on your right has a bluish lip. I noticed yesterday the bluish doesn't show up too well in here with the lighting, but uh, uh, anyway, this one on this side is. Uh, the Cooksonia variety that goes back to the 1800s. And we're happy to have that one in our collection. And I have bread with it too. And then uh, these are some hybrids from Cattleya labiata. Big Ben again is a light blue. Uh, the Norman's Bay Lucille, I was fortunate enough, uh, it, it's identified with Jones and Scully. And I was fortunate enough to be there when it got its FCC. Uh, the Florida growers had been growing it for years, and it was so much in demand that as soon as they could divide their plant, they would. And over in St. Petersburg, there was a grower. Her name was Betty Guthrie, Ms. Robert Guthrie. Uh, she had all the money she needed, and so uh, she didn't need to trade or, or sell a piece of her plant. And so she put it in a bulb pan. It's a, it was a terracotta bulb pan with tree fern. And she let it grow all the way across the pot. And so it made these beautiful upright growths. And there were two growths. Each of them had two blooms. This is not the award picture, but the, uh, it was the most gorgeous Catley I've ever seen. I was at the show. This was in Winter Haven, Florida, 1964. And, um, and I, so I saw the plant when it got its FCC, and it was the most magnificent Catley I've ever seen. I got a bug you to know the program. My mother's name has one L. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. You're not supposed to say anything to the end of it. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. 
Yeah, you could have emailed me or written me with that yeah. comment. Yeah. I can't type. Uh, yeah, okay. But obviously I can't type either. I meant to put one L. But uh, anyway, and the one on the lower, your lower right is uh, Catlia Steve Usar. That is actually a first generation Labiata hybrid. It's a good sized flower. It's Labiata Cooksonii crossed with uh, Starting Point. And uh, very nice uh, flower. Is that a part of the Uh Yes, yeah, that's one of our hybrids. One of my crosses. <clears throat> now let's go to the Andes and talk about other Catlias. The Andes uh, stretch up and down north and south across South America on the west side of the continent. And they're 4,300 miles long and 430 miles wide. Average height 13,000 feet. The tallest is 22,841 feet. And it covers, they, cover, they go from Venezuela down to Argentina. Um, I do cover some plants from Costa Rica here, and I, I still think the mountains in Costa Rica are part of the Andes, but um, anyway, that's wh where the Andes are. And we're going to start uh, on the northern part. We're going to start with Venezuela and work our way south. And this is the Catlia mossy. And that's the way it grows in nature, uh, way up on the branches of, tr uh, up on the trunks or branches of trees. Uh, you know why the Catlias grow in those higher heights. Uh, if you come to the rainforest there, um, there's hardly any light reaches the floor in the denser parts of the rainforest. And so there's not much vegetation. You can walk in there and the big tree trunks are like columns in a, in a church or sanctuary. And the, uh, the plant life is up in the trees, except for saprophytes like mushrooms and so forth. They don't need the light, but the orchids, the ferns, bromeliads, a lot of different uh, epiphytes uh, way up in the trees so they get light. Some of the catlias are actually in full sunlight. Uh, I found out that in Newberry, South Carolina, they can't take full sunlight. Uh, but I found out also uh, when I went to Singapore, and I'm sure it's the same way in, in the mountains of Andes, of the Andes, uh, in the morning uh, you have some sun. Uh, but the temperature is a little cooler. But then by mid-morning, you've got clouds. And then uh, usually, even in the dry season, they might have a light shower. Um, and so the, a good bit of clouds remain and then some evaporative cooling in the afternoon. And you have a higher elevation, and so it doesn't get quite as hot in, to begin with. So, so they can take uh, much more light down there than they can uh, in Newberry, South Carolina. They probably could take more light in Florida than they can up in Newberry because y'all get the semi-tropical um, climate. Uh, the early plant collectors would uh, cut down these huge trees and they would strip them of the orchids. But that's the only way they could really get to them. You can imagine trying to get those Cattleya mosses. These are both Cattleya mosses. And of course, uh, back then, for Easter, uh, Carter and Holmes would cut, the week before Easter, they would cut between 6,000 and 8,000 8, Cattleya blooms, most all of them Cattleya mossy. Um, they did not know about virus control back then. In fact, Bill Carter, till the day he died, had a pocket knife that had never been sterilized. And when he walked through the greenhouses, he'd pull it out, and if there was a, a, some spent blooms on a plant, he would whack off the spike. But uh, so when I went there, there was a lot of virus in the collection. Right now, um, we have a few in a little one spot that are virus that we know about. And the others, uh, I, I don't think we have virus in the rest of the collection. But anyway, the, uh, the plants would expire eventually, and they would have to get in a new shipment. And they would get them by the carload from Thomas Young Orchids up in New Jersey or other brokers and uh, then pot them up, and they would, mossy blooms pretty well. They'll have a good many blooms per plant, a good many blooms on the stem. Um, I was telling Ken, that may be real, one reason that Mendelia was never as popular was because it doesn't produce the kind of blooms that the mossy does. And, and for me, Mendelia is a slower grower 
uh, the mosses, uh, the seedlings grow up real fast and start blooming pretty well. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, that's the story about the cut flowers, but I do want to show you, in a minute I'll show you uh, uh, what Carter and Holmes looked like uh, when the cut flowers were in full bloom. Uh, these are different color forms of Cattleya mossy. Uh, the two on the left, the lavender form, that is a sibling cross that I made. I, I had a plant that uh, was still there at Carter and Holmes when I got there, and it was Cattleya mossy, and it said Rapella strain. Joe Rapella was in California, and uh, he bred uh, mosses with each other, and he got to the seventh generation of his own breeding, improving the color, uh, improving the form somewhat. Uh, these are typical mossy form. They have the, the dog-eared petals, but uh, they have a uh, nice uh, color and they have, uh, they're very prolific, and uh, so they're typical mossy. The, the other parent of this came from uh, uh, Ralph Kieswater's collection up in uh, New York, so it's a very old collected plant also, but a selected one. And so, uh, of course, I think the key sweater plant had virus. The rapella does not, but uh, anyway, these seedlings do not have uh, virus, and so they've grown well. Um, the uh, lower middle is one of the Rhinichianas, uh, so named for the, the uh, mottled leaf color, uh, lip coloring there, the beautiful modeling in the lip. Uh, a lot of people prefer the solid lips. I really like that lip, especially with the white margin around it. Uh, I like that sort of waterfall pattern in there. Now, the upper right one is, a diff is another semi-alba, and it is a huge flower. It's about eight inches across. And then down below it is one that has a bluish lip. We have a number of uh, cerulea mosses that I brought back from Venezuela that are, are really uh, very pretty, uh, have nice blue color in the lip. And this is one that Andy Easton gave us years ago it's one that he found in a uh, collection of, of, of seedlings at, at Rob McClellan, a group of seedlings that were in bloom. This one had heavier substance and was a very full, uh, it has wide petals even though it has the typical mossy shape, but uh, this is a polyploid, I'm assuming a tetraploid, it is fertile, and uh, it received its award of merit a couple of years ago on the plant that we grew. Uh, it's a very, very nice thing. And this year I bloomed uh, a seedling from this crossed with a diploid uh, form of mossy, uh, Ed Patterson clone. And uh, it was really, really good. I'm sorry I didn't bring a picture of it, but uh, it, it has better form by far than this. But uh, this has that smooth texture that uh, uh, Mr. Mantellini was talking about. Uh, that he was seeking was a real smooth texture. Well, this one is extremely smooth. That's just one of the greenhouses. They had two greenhouses that were 200 feet long, and both of them looked just like this. That's how many were blooming and at Carter and Holmes. This is the week before Easter, before they were cut. And uh, uh, some of these are hybrids, uh, but some are species, the species mosses. As you see, can see, they have white and, and lavender. They actually got more, more for the white blooms. They charge more for the white blooms because it was harder to get a white bloom without blemishes uh, than it was for a lavender. All right, they, they started in business in 1947. The wholesale price of a bloom was ten dollars. That's in, back in those days, and so they made all their money off of cut flowers. Uh, but in the current time, hmm? in the present time, no, we don't sell any cut flowers at all. No, no. Yeah, we had, that had ended by the time when blue jeans became fashionable. <laughs> of course, I just went out the window. <laughs> I remember when I was growing up at Easter and Mother's Day, all the ladies would have on an orchid corsage. All the really special ladies would have on an orchid corsage. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, the other growers were a lot bigger. Lyons orchids was very big, and, and Hauserman and others. 
But anyway, uh, yeah, by the time I got there in 1986, uh, no-cut flowers were being sold. And uh, the, uh, it was entirely the hobby market. Yes? And when we're doing more famous, that's all we see. Beg your pardon? For cut flowers, uh, there are a number of uh, things. Uh, um, let me think of some of those names there. Uh, Marilyn. We still have a number of them. Um, uh, Arthur Miles is one. Arthur Miles is a famous mossy hybrid. And Ptarmigan Ridge is one that came from the Beale Company. And uh, it's very prolific. We still have it. Uh, we have a number of uh, mossy-derived hybrids, but, but it's back in several generations in the background. But uh, we, because there's no demand for the cut flowers for that each season, um, they're just a, a small portion of our collection. You know, it's not, we don't breed that much with them. Stewart's has a, a plant called Lake Chitwood. Kachuma, I guess it's an armacross cross, but anyway, Lake Kachuma is a great spring uh, bloomer for that season. It has much improved uh, flowers. Hey, yeah. Uh, we used to grow a lot of flowers from Brighton years ago, back in the 60s and yeah. 70s. Our cut flower did, did fail after about 74. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we could give away. That was a pretty good price. Ten dollars uh, back in the 40s was really exceptional. Yeah. And they used that money to build greenhouses. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people I, don't know it, but uh, Plato was so kind as to give me the original copy of <coughs> Fortune magazine. In the height of the Depression, Thomas Young and Bound Brooks sold his nursery and became an instant millionaire and moved to England. And they were, uh, an orchid business was on Wall Street, commonly held stock. And in New York City in 1932, a white cattleya in Moran's Forest, which was its premier on Madison Avenue, was going for $27. Yeah. Yeah, uh, if, you hear what, if you couldn't hear what, if you couldn't hear what Jeff said, he said that at one point back, uh, th this was in the 30s, 30, 30, in the 30s, <laughs> that a white cattleya on, uh, in New York was selling, for, the bloom was selling for $27. Did that magazine, Gene, that I gave to uh, to Jeff, they had, this was during the Depression years, they were selling $2 million in cut flowers a year during yeah. the Depression. And people asked why. People couldn't afford to take their girlfriends to uh, trips and fancy things, but they could always give them a flower or their mother for right. or Mother's Day. And people literally became millionaires on cut flowers in those days. During the Depression, uh, what they're saying is that people, some nurseries became millionaires because of the cut flower business because people couldn't afford to do as much mm -hmm. other stuff so they could still buy their <laughs> wife or, or their mistress a uh, flower. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the word you used. but. Yeah. Okay, these are some hybrids from it. Tarbigan Ridge, I mentioned. Betty Monroe is a recent hybrid. Uh, it's one of Bill Carter's crosses. And uh, we have Mary clones of that plant. But, uh, and we, we've had Mary clones of the Tarbigan Ridge. I'm not sure we still have them. But uh, uh, the Tarbigan Ridge, you can see there's three blooms there. Well, no, four blooms, I think. But anyway, it's very productive, and the flowers are large on it. Okay, another species and the national flower of Venezuela is Cattleya ludimiana. And uh, we heard a lot about Cattleya ludimiana. Um, <coughs> well, we heard a lot about Mossy yesterday, but um, uh, Mr. Mandolini is an expert on ludimiana. It has some of the finest in the world. This is a seedling I brought back from Venezuela uh, that I purchased from Enrique Graff. And we put it on a tree fern totem. And I'm showing you this because it's a good example of the way the Cattleya species love to grow. They like to grow like they're in nature. And they don't 
like to be disturbed that much. They, you know, the roots, when we repot them, it always sets them back. And so uh, if I had a, a collection of, of cattleya, especially if I had a collection of cattleya species, I would pr try to grow a lot of them in this way, uh, grow them on the uh, tree fern totems or uh, in baskets with uh, bark or something, with uh, like uh, cork, you know, oak bark, uh, because they do like to grow that way. This one uh, in the summertime is under the shade cloth outside and it gets sprinkled every morning. And so it really loves that. This is a famous uh, Ludomaniana. It is not yellow, it is white, pure white, with the uh, white edge to that lip, and a very beautiful lip. It dates back to the 18, her, uh, early 1900s at least. It got an FCC in the early 1900s in England. But uh, we were lucky to get a virus-free plant of this. And uh, we have not tissued it, but uh, someday we may tissue it. I think that'll be the best way to reproduce this. Beautiful, it, it grows well, it's a compact plant, very compact. Uh, gorgeous flowers though. Yeah? Is, is the seed the uh, area right of the Bible or where the color is missing? Yeah. At the telltale sign of Samuel. Yeah. It, it always has, now there yeah, are the, semi-albers. Yeah, there's one the called Saravati that's sometimes uh, confused with Stanley Eye, but it has more solid lip color and it does not have what uh, Ken's talking about. Uh, that little blemish there occurs when the lip is folded up before the flower opens. It's got a little less color there. Uh, this is a blue one, and again, the blue doesn't really show in here, but it has a beautiful blue lip. This is one I got from Bill Rogerson, uh, one that he got an award on. And it's grown very well for us, and very beautiful every year. And it's a large flowered one. Uh, I don't know, is, where is Bill? Is he here? Yes, Bill, uh, you remember the size on the flower? Um, well, if I was Jeff Bradley, I'd say nine inches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I, so that means seven of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, uh, this is uh, one of Joe, well, Joe Grosafi has this plant. He's got it in his list available right now, so if you're interested in it, he might have one available. But uh, this is uh, Ludomaniana variety Missy, which is a concolor form of Ludomaniana. And uh, I think it's extremely beautiful. Uh, I took this picture at one of the shows. We don't own this plant, wish we did. And this is one we do own. This is our Mendenhall clone. It's a dark one, very round flower. And I've used this uh, in producing some offspring. Uh, I don't, none of them are available yet, but they will be. But uh, this is a selfing of Stewart's variety. And it's plants I got from uh, Steve Christopherson out on the West Coast. Yeah, I got a couple of nice things from, from there. But um, these are the natural hybrid of Cat Catlia mossy and Catlia ludomaniana. And I'm sure that this has been made artificially as well. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the moss, the Gravesiana, the lavender one here, was awarded as a mossy. It was mossy Panther Creek, got an HCC. And you know there's a mossy Willowbrook got an FCC, and it's no more Catlia Mossy than I am. It, it's a uh, Gravesiana also. You can see Ludomaniana all over it. But the one on the right here was awarded as a Ludomaniana, actually back then as a Specius sisima. It got an FCC from the American Orchid Society the year I was born as, uh, uh, as, as Specius sisima Snow Queen. Uh, it did belong to Ralph Keysweater again up in New York. And uh, I obtained the plant uh, down here in Florida from a Mr. Crookshank up in St. Augustine back when I was here in the 1960s. But uh, it is virus. And uh, what I found was uh, I selfed it. 
to, to see, you know, get away from the virus. If you self a plant that's virus and plant dry seed, uh, the tra virus will not transmit. And so um, that's what we did with that one. And from the uh, results, we got some beautiful pure whites. This is one uh, that got an AM uh, up in uh, Tennessee uh, for Ed Merkel up there. But it's one of my seedlings from that selfing. And it was a very beautiful thing. I think some of those would be good to breed, breed with further. Uh, haven't done that yet. Gene, yeah. I, I have two of those from you that yeah. just moved. Good, good. They're pure white. Yeah. They really are pure white. Um, Cantlia persevaliana is another one of the Venezuelan orchids. And actually, it's, I'm, I more commonly associate Venezuela with Percivaliana than I do with, uh, uh, with the Ludomanianas because uh, you see more Percivalianas around. Uh, and these pictures were taken in nature there by Greg Alicus. And you'll notice that uh, they're growing on rocks uh, and they're very exposed, as you can see. As I was talking about, you know, they, they're out where they can get plenty of light. And uh, this is another one that, this is Michael Sin with one that's growing on rocks there. As you can see, it's a healthy plant. Uh, also uh, notice that the plant itself is fairly compact. That's, that's true of the species in general. Uh, the plants don't get very tall. Um, and I have another picture that shows that. I think it might be the next one. No, it's further over. Uh, all right, is there any question why it's called the Christmas orchid? Sometimes it blooms for Christmas. Sometimes it blooms for Christmas. Most of the time, most of the time it blooms in November. Always early as September, as Bob says. So, uh, uh, but a fair amount of time it blooms at Christmas. And uh, these these ceramic Santa Clauses were some that Bill Carter made and painted. He was quite an artist. And uh, those were some he gave us as Christmas gifts. And so one year I just plopped it up there and took a picture of the Perseveliana. That is Perseveliana Summit. This shows, uh, this is a fairly compact plant. <coughs> I took this at Leonard John's place in Hawaii. And I don't have a clonal name for this. It didn't have a clonal name on it. It just said Perseveliana. But it's a very nice one. And uh, this is considered a blue clone. Wait a minute. That's not supposed to do that. Okay. There we go. Uh, if the lighting were better, you would be able to see a pale bluish tone in the petals. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Jeff said it's the best of the blue. Perseverianus, and uh, we do have this in our collection, but I haven't even selfed it. I guess I should try. All right, this is a uh, polyploid. I'm assuming tetraploid. We haven't counted it, but it's a polyploid uh, mutation of the summit clone. When I was, uh, the Air Force sent me to school at Penn State University to learn weather forecasting. I got a degree in meteorology there in one year. Every chance I got, well, I would go down to Longwood a good bit, but every chance I got, I would go over to Laurel, New Jersey to uh, visit uh, Lager and Hurl. And John Lager was a fine gentleman, and he's another one who took me under his wing. And every time I would visit there, I would say, um, I would see something in bloom, and I'd say, I sure would like to have a piece of that. I sure would like to have a piece of the other. Um, I graduated in 1964, and my parents came up, and we went to New York for the <coughs> World's Fair, and we didn't want to park in the city, so we parked our car at uh, Lager and Hurl's greenhouses, and we uh, took a taxi into uh, the city from there. But the, uh, when we came back to pick up our car, uh, I walked back through the greenhouses one more time, and I was getting ready to leave, and John said, wait a minute. He said, I got something for you. He had a box, and there was a 
plant of everything I'd exhibited an interest in in the whole year that I've been visiting in. And uh, he did charge me for them. <laughs> and some of them were started back bulbs, you know, uh, like a three or four bulb back division with the new growth coming up. And uh, he charged me like 10 for some, 20 for some, whatever. And one of the plants I got was Perseveriana Summit. Uh, that plant was collected in 18, no, in 1922, 1922 by that John Logger's father. And uh, it was grown, and in 1972, 50 years later, the American Orchid Society judges decided that it was good enough for an award. So I keep telling people, if you take a plant for judging and they don't award it, it might take them 50 years <laughs> to realize. I've got a better, I have a, another example of that in a minute. You just keep taking it back. But this one only got an AM, uh, whereas Summit has an FCC. Now this is a much better bloom because it's got wider segment, segment, especially the lip is wider, but it's not larger. Uh, when uh, the diploid forms are converted in, intentionally or unintentionally, like in this case in tissue culture, uh, they're converted and so the flowers have heavier substance, but they are not larger. Uh, usually they're smaller. And if it's a plant that has a lot of blooms on the stem, the converted one will not have as many because so much substance goes into the blooms, it can't make as many blooms. So. Uh, that's probably one reason it didn't get an FCC. It was not as large or as the taller. Huh? Or the taller. Yeah. You anyway. Know, when Marisnip first came out, I remember going down to John Costello, and I would look for plants that you thought were mutations like that. And I remember Tony coming up to me and said, What are you doing? And I said, Well, I'm looking for certain type plants, you know, shorter growth, closer together. I remember the Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we're not going to get into <laughs> we're not going to get into judging today I, I kept my mouth shut yesterday <laughs> uh, this is a Venezuelan uh, species also Catlia gascaliana I wish you could see the blue in the lip of this flower it is a gorgeous blue but uh, this is one of the ones I brought back from my trip down there. And all the ones I brought back, I bought in the nurseries there. I didn't go out and collect anything. But uh, it's supposed to bloom in the midsummer. But in uh, this year, our Gascaliana has all bloomed in May. And uh, so they were very early this year. Uh, and I found in, for the past 10 or 15 years, uh, plants have been blooming out of season more often uh, than they used to. But anyway, it's easy to grow, and uh, because it blooms in midsummer, the blooms don't last as long, but, the, but they last a couple of weeks at least. And this is a concolor form. These are all plants that I brought uh, back. Uh, Gascaliana concolor. <coughs> They're usually not as large, uh, and since they bloom about the same time as uh, Varshavitsii or Jagas, um, they're dwarf compared to it plant-wise and bloom-wise. Okay, this is Costa Rica Panama native. <coughs> uh, some types of Dawiana are called the Rosita form because they have this increased coloring in the petals. They have a darker coloring in the petals and a darker yellow color as a background. Uh, and if these are bred, if the if the Costa Rican or Panamanian Dalvianas are bred with lavender catlias, they intensify the color. And uh, the modern red catlias with good size uh, all come from the, the, uh, this type of breeding. Uh, Catlia fabia was one of the first, and it was labiata, a lavender labiata crossed with uh, 
uh, Dalliana, and very, very dark flowers. And uh, this is Fred Clark's Dalliana Rosita, which got an FCC AOS. And uh, you can see it's quite remarkable for form. That was recently awarded. And this is the kind of colors, uh, this is uh, redder than it shows for you probably, but uh, it's a large flower, Fort Watson Mendenhall, and the red uh, in there comes from the Dalian in the background. Of course, it has other species back there too. And these are three more. Uh, Edisto Newberry is a, really a nice red, and then the Chill in New City. Uh, these are all hybrids from Oconee Mendenhall, our famous breeder. Oconee was actually a cross made in Hawaii. Ernest, in Hawaii, Ernest Iwanaga had the uh, uh, one parent, and, uh, and Ben Kodama had the other. Uh, he had the Normans Bay. This is a, Oconee was bred from Normans Bay Lucille. Uh, and the other parent was uh, owned by Ernest Iwanaga. And so, uh, and the plants were sold to Carter and Holmes, the seedlings, by William Kirsch orchids, who were brokers. They brokered for a lot of Hawaiian growers. And so, uh, when they flowered, uh, Bill Carter wrote to Kirsch and asked permission to name the cross. And Kirsch wrote a letter saying, oh yeah, you've got permission to name the cross, whereas they hadn't really made the cross. but. Uh, Anyway, that's how it got named Oconee. Oconee was a, uh, is a river in South Carolina and Georgia, and also it's our uh, northernmost county of South Carolina, Oconee County. Oconee was the chief of the snake clan of the Cherokee Indians. And he has a rather romantic story behind his name. But anyway, uh, the Barney Garrison, the, the lower one on the right, has those darker flares in the petals. And that's the, if you remember the, uh, the mosses that uh, had the flaring in the petal tips and so forth, uh, this, this is coming from a, from a Cattleya triani in the background, one or more trianis that have those flares. I think Luster Westenberg has flaring, and that's coming from the triani in the background. But these are Carter and Holmes hybrids. And this is one of my crosses that has Oconee in the background. It also has Bryce Canyon in the background, and so it has that more yellow in the lip. But, but uh, the, the rich color and the, the yellow lip coloring, a lot of that is coming from the Dalian in the background. You can't see Lucille in there at all, can you? Huh? You can't see Lucille in there at all. Actually, Lowe's is in the background of this one, not Lucy. Yeah. Well, Lucille is in the background through Oconee. Oh, but then later, uh, Lowe's was introduced also. Look at that, it's Norman's Bay all over here. It's just yeah. very strong. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Okay. And then I crossed it with a Dalliana, uh, with the uh, Costa Rican form. And you can see what it did. Even as dark as the previous one was, this, the Dalliana in, increased the color even more. This is a gorgeous flower, and it grows well too. Uh, but uh, we just have the one plant right now. And then uh, this is bred from the Michael Crocker, um, and uh, it has another dose of the Bryce Canyon, given that yellow lip. Uh, I think it's one of my favorites. Uh, we named it Newberry Beauty, but uh, okay, let's go on down to the country of Columbia where there's another thing that's sometimes called Dalian, Cattleya Daviana, uh, Daviana aurea. Uh, I personally think it should be called Cattleya aurea. It ought to be a different species. A lot of other people disagree with that, but, but it breeds totally different. This is actually a painting that Willistine Post did from a picture that uh, Keith Davis provided. And I think Keith, this is Keith's plan, I think. But uh, anyway, gorgeous, gorgeous flowering. And uh, I've got some more pictures here. Uh, this is out of the, uh, is that the Lindenia? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, we were talking we were talking about some of those early collections having better flowers than anything in the rainforest today, or anything we collect today. Um, and this is true. Now, these were painted uh, probably from from real life, you know, from from looking at the flower. But we don't know whether these plants, whether any of these plants survive very long or not. You, might, you know, back in those days in England, they had what they call stove houses, and they grew everything real warm. And uh, we have found, even at Carter and Holmes, that we have difficulty growing the aurea form. Um, the regular Costa Rican form of Dalliana grows pretty well, but uh, the aurea form has been very difficult for us, and I don't know what the secret is to growing that, but if anybody does, let me know. Uh, anyway, beautiful thing. But the color, when you use it in breeding, that color totally washes out. Uh, this is a case where I crossed the one in the upper right with uh, Labiata cooksonii, which is in the lower right. And uh, these, again, these lights give it some color, but that's pure white, the one in the upper left there, pure white with the beautiful lip that comes from the Dalliana. Uh, that's Fabia, but it's an Alba form of Fabia. So you can have, it could be the same name, but if it's made by different color forms, wh whether the blue ones or whatever, uh, the colors will be different. Uh, there are white cattleya mosses, uh, you know, there are white mosses, there are dark lavender mosses, semi alba mosses, so it depends on which color. The Dalliana from Colombia, um, it grows at higher elevation. Yeah. It's cool, very cool nights, and it has to be drier yeah. than the one from Costa Rica. So if possible to grow it, it is more difficult. Yeah. But it breeds, uh, still gives you uh, some transportation. And yeah. yeah, we have had problems with rot, <coughs> rot in that, and it may be because we don't dry it out. Bob is saying that the, uh, the aurea farm from, from uh, Columbia grows in high elevations where it gets cool nights, and it needs cool nights, and it needs to be grown drier than the, uh, the one from uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, like I say, we've had problems with rot getting into our aurea forms, but they just are a little slower growing too. But the hybrids from them, uh, this, these fabias grow like crazy. Uh, primary hybrids tend to have what they call hybrid vigor. Are we all familiar with that? All right, what do you get when you breed with Cattleya aurea? Where well, you don't get yellow color, the yellow color in these flowers is coming mostly from what's now called Cattleya cinnabarina, used to be Lelia cinnabarina. The yellow color uh, is coming from the Brazilian rupiculus Lelias. They are dominant for color. And uh, in the first generation, you get a fair amount of yellow color from them. But then if you breed further, you can really intensify that yellow. And so these have uh, those factors but also, uh, Dalliana is, sh is short-lived flowers. They bloom in, in the late summer, and uh, if they last a week, you're doing pretty good. The, uh, uh, they've been bred with uh, Brazilian bifoliates and things like that to increase the substance and the longevity of the flowers. And so when you look at these, you can see, let me see, ah, can't believe it worked. When you look at these, you can see, in this one, you see the little cleft in the lip there, these, these little cut lips, uh, and even, even in this one, there's a little cleft. They indicate the bifoliates in the background, Cattleya bicolor, granulosa, or whatever, because they have what's called a spade lip. And, uh, and so we still see that um, in these hybrids further down. But when you see a flower that has uh, something like this edging here and the edging there, that's coming from the Dalliana. And these probably have the uh, Colombian form in there also, the Rosita form, uh, in addition to the Aurea. The Aurea is what gives these gorgeous lips with the, uh, especially this one, with the beautiful veining and the dark colored tip of the lip. Uh, those are all uh, Carter and Holmes hybrids. Uh, Marilyn Carter, it was Bill Carter's wife, and he made that hybrid. And in the background of this is Cattleya Bob Betts. 
the standard white. So you can see where the form is greatly improved. Uh, we found the early yellows, when I started growing orchids, uh, the, the yellow hybrids were spindly plants. They, they had narrow bulbs and they had narrow leaves. And they were non-vigorous. And uh, as the first bloom seedling would have a normal flower, but as the plant got older, it would start deforming. And uh, that's what I call orchid senility. <laughs> they would, they would uh, gradually get to where you could hardly recognize the flower because so much deformity existed in the yellows. And by breeding those back to normal uh, standard cattleyas and then breeding back, back and forth to get the color, uh, we were able to get away from the deformity. So there's no deformity whatsoever in these. But uh, the, uh, even uh, Toshi Eoki, the, the Hawaiian hybrid, has Norman's Bay Lowe's in the background. So uh, they, that's where you get the non-deforming yellows. Is where they've been bred to the standards. Is, is the Lou Gilmore a Toshi hybrid too? Lou Gilmore is a Mary, Mary Ellen Carter hybrid. The other parent Mary, is Mary Ellen Carter by Sheen Bouton d'Or. And the Sheen gives these bright yellow eyes. But uh, this is your particular. Sheen virus free? Huh? Is your Sheen yes, virus free? our Sheen is virus free. Wow. We have a lot of uh, virus free plants that we've picked up through the years. But anyway, it. Uh, this is actually from a sibling cross. Bill Carter told me when I came there, he says, always make sibling crosses because that's the only way you're going to see what you were looking for to start with, where you were looking to combine good features of this plant with good features of that plant. Uh, in the first generation, you might not get it, but if you breed them together, a percentage of the second generation will have what you're looking for, and that one is from that second generation. That's one of Carter Holmes' plants now? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it grows extremely well. We have not tissued it yet. Uh, it actually is on, it's about the third year it's bloomed, I guess. Um, another one with the Dowiana influence is this one. This is Owen Holmes Royal Glitter. And it always has this glittering gold edge, much brighter than shows in this picture uh, under these lights, but uh, still um, very unique, very unusual form. And uh, ever since I've been at Carter and Holmes, we've tried to tissue culture this one, but we've not been able to get it to multiply in the laboratory. But we haven't given up. This is one of Bill Carter's crosses, Caesar's head. Uh, it has the Dowiana back there. This, uh, we crossed one of the Owen Holmeses uh, with another. And in the second generation, we got, uh, let me back up and show you. Owen Holmes, this, this is an Owen Holmes, but Owen Holmes is Oconee Mendenhall crossed with Harlequin Act I. And so in the second generation, we got this one, and I named it Encore because it's like the Harlequin color coming back for an Encore in the next generation. And then we crossed this plant with uh, George King Serendipity, and we got this cross. Some of those are light yellow. This has a little picotty edge uh, to the, the whole flower, uh, especially around the lip. But uh, very large flower, heavy substance, very good hybrid. Uh, I mentioned the spade lips. This is a Marilyn Carter hybrid, uh, Susan Fender. And uh, it has a spade lip, and that's what's coming through from the uh, bifolates in the background. This one has a story. This is, uh, huh? Cattleya Triani Mary Fennell. Uh, the Fennell Orchid Company here in Florida dated back to the 1800s. And one of the, the, the founder of the company collected this plant in, in, in Columbia, country of Columbia, back in 1888. Um, this is how it flowers in our collection today. So it's been in cultivation for a very long time. Uh, I was collecting it in 88, and in 1989, 101 years later, it gave, uh, the AOS gave it an HCC. <laughs> so 
I mentioned with the, with the Perseverance of the Summit, it took 50 years. Well, this one, it took 101 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, unbelievably, uh, we have found virus-free plants of some things like the sheen and so forth that uh, we didn't think existed. And in this case, uh, I went to Florida. I was down here on a trip. And it was after Hurricane Andrew, not too long after Hurricane Andrew. And Fennell Orchid Jungle was in Homestead, and uh, it was a public uh, garden, you know. They charged admission, and they sold orchids and everything. And uh, they had naturalized orchids all over the trees. They had these huge oak trees of just uh, where they had fastened all these orchids up there. Well, they had the Ben Lake problem, and they lost a lot of stuff for that. But then, when Andrew came, it blew down all the trees, stripped the, most of the epiphytes off and put them out in the Everglades. And uh, they went down and salvaged what they could out of the trees. And this is a plant that was growing up in the trees. It had the label, Mary Fennell, Triani Mary Fennell. But because it had been growing up in the trees, uh, it uh, was naturalized, you know. And so it didn't get virus. And so... Uh, on this trip, I went by in Coconut Creek, uh, Tom Fennell III had put up a greenhouse, and he had some of these plants that had been salvaged, and he had this laying on a bench. It was bare root, but he had a price tag on it, which was not that cheap. But anyway, uh, it turned out to be not virus, and, and so I, it's one of the best acquisitions I've made. Still beautiful, and it's the parent of Bill Rogerson's Cashins variety that has an FCC, which is one of the very best of the Trianis. Uh, characteristic of Triani is this smaller lip. But just look at those broad petals. I mean, uh, they give the broad petals to all of their hybrids. They tend to bloom in January, uh, and most of their hybrids tend to bloom in January. This is another one that has an interesting history. I bought this plant from Bruce Pearson here in Florida, down in Boynton Beach. He had gotten it out from a grower in Brazil, and the <laughs> grower in Brazil had gotten it out of Europe, and of course the European grower had gotten it out of the U U.S. Because A.C. Burridge was the first president of the American Orchid Society, and uh, this clone was named for him, and it was awarded by the American Orchid Society. It was not named for him. He named it. All right, he named it. He, he named it for him. Uh, but anyway, it was his plant. And uh, this was back in the 1930s. And so to have a virus-free plant of that is remarkable as well. And, is there uh, a clean piece of that gene anywhere? Huh? Is there a clean piece? Oh, yeah, we have it. We have a. We just sold a division of it. Uh, Your, your pictures had eyes on them, but uh, I was, I was, I've been beaten with a whip to take the eyes off of all of my trainers. Yeah. Well, yeah, Ron McCadden is the one who beat me on it. Anyway, uh, you can see what kind of qualities Triani transmits to its hybrids. Horace is almost a direct, you know, it's, it's Triani and one or two other species at most. And uh, I mentioned the other, the earlier, the petal flares, and uh, this is uh, a hybrid that has those, and this is not pyloric. Uh, it, it's not trying to make three lips, and so the petals are always perfectly flat when they have these markings coming from the Triani. And, uh, Horace, you know, gives this form to other hybrids and lets color come through from the other parent. Because it is uh, so close to a species, it, it lets the other parent be dominant for color and it's dominant for form. What is uh, Leora Hewlett, I, I think? Uh, Leora Hewlett is a hybrid that uh, was made by Lager and Hurel okay. in New Jersey. The, the Hewlett's used to live in New Jersey, then they moved to South Carolina. And Leora was a judge, AOS judge. And uh, Lager and Huro made this uh, cross, and it, it was a cross. One of the parents was Governor Gore, which has that dark, very round lip. And uh, so the Leora Hewlett had tiny tip flares, not, not this much. 
But it's one of the ones I saw at Lager and Hill and asked for, and that's one of the ones in that box <laughs> that I brought back with me. Uh, now this one can be probably bigger than that. How, how big can it be? That's uh, seven inches. Fourteen inches. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> fourteen. That's a backbone. Well, you see, I say over seven inches, so that's fourteen is over seven. <laughs> it's a very large flower, and uh, it, the plant we have is not virus, and. Uh, We've, been, we've recently sold divisions of that too, but we've not tissued it. Too often with one flower. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, well, it'll make two. Yeah, I know, but too often with one. But a lot of them. Well, a lot of them, just one, yeah. And if anybody wants to have an argument about that, talk to Joe Grisoff because he has the de facto truth about the whole story. It is a species, so don't argue with him. Okay. Don't argue with him? With Joe. This is Bobel's Honolulu. This is actually Joe Grozoffi's plant. Uh, this was famous because uh, back at Rivermont Orchids, uh, uh, they were talking about the plants being shipped over from England. And this is an English hybrid, made it black and flory in England. But it was shipped over uh, uh, during the World War II to Tennessee, to Rivermont Orchids. and. Uh, they had this, they flowered this particular clone, and, uh, and one of the McDades, Everest McDade, selfed this plant. And when Carter and Holmes wanted to expand their business in the 1950s, 1953 to be exact, they went to see Everest McDade and they bought 5,000 plants of the selfing of this. And then uh, they flowered out some gorgeous things. Several of them were awarded. Uh, I helped with some of their shows here in Florida, including one over in Tampa while I was down here in the Air Force in the 60s. And uh, they got an award on a, a Bobel's over there that's from that selfing. Uh, and it's the I don't, very first plant ever, ever cloned, ever. Yeah, actually, uh, he actually cloned the selfing. Yeah, but I mean, this particular one. Yeah. But nowadays, it's extremely rare. Uh, Joe Grisafi does have it. Um, but it made some magnificent. Uh, the offspring was better than this plant itself. Um, this was mentioned yesterday, this uh, Trani jungle feather. Uh, this is a collection from nature. And uh, when you talk about color break virus uh, in cat leaves, a lot of times that's, this is what you're looking at. This one is definitely not virused. We, our piece is very clean, but it does bloom like this. It's a natural coloration. Very uh, unusual cattleya. And these are other examples of uh, flares in the petals coming from the triani. Very flat, flat, <coughs> flat blooms, but these are flares that are not uh, pyloric. And that Leora Hewlett, that's the kind of lip the Leora Hewlett has, very big round lip. And Toshioki, I mentioned Norman's Bay in the background, so there's Luster Work Westenburg back there. Yes, Ken. Did, did, did you all make any hybrids of jungle feathers? I have not tried to, no. We've had it for a number of years, but, but I haven't tried to make any. I don't know whether Joe's still here or not, but he's tried over and over, and it does not do well. Has not? Okay, it does not. Why? This is pizzazz. We have robin. We have several of them. There's no color in the, in the uh, field. Pizzazz is full of color. Yeah, pizzazz should have a lot of color in the wild. Where? Blue right now. Yeah. You mean in here? Yes. Yeah, well, this one, flowers. yeah, this one does. Uh, this might have been a winter blooming because it does bloom twice a year for us. So. I know the Marion and Carter Dixon hummingbird, when it blooms in the winter, it hardly has hardly any color. When it blooms in the summer, it's got that solid red around the petals, so it might be that. But. <coughs> yeah, but we do have robin. Robin's a very good one. In fact, we have blooming ansel. Uh, just went out of bloom, but uh, I, I made a sib cross of pizzazz and blooming ansel. All right, we're not going to talk long about Varshavitsi because it hadn't been used that much. It, 
It does give those yellow eyes to its offspring. Uh, I was shown a picture at Carter and Holmes that Bill Carter made of a plant of this that had 13 blooms on one stem. And this is one of the largest of the Cattleya species, flower-wise. Uh, so that's why it was called Gigas or, is it Gigas or Gigas? Gigas. Gigas. Neither one, Gigas, okay. All right, Gigas. And that's really its name. Yeah, well, it was changed to Varshavitsia because it's easier to pronounce. Than uh, yeah. <laughs> it blooms in midsummer. It was never used in the cut flower business because the flowers are not very long lasting, but also because there are no women large enough to wear. Of <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Jeff knows some women in Texas that I don't know. But uh, this is probably the most famous of all of the varsity This is the Furman Lambo, and uh, John Lager di uh, discovered this and collected it. And in 1910, he received five thousand dollars for the plant, which is equivalent to a hundred thousand dollars today. So. Uh, it's amazing. Still in, still in collections. It was selfed, and the clone Leo Holquin got an FCC also. Uh, and both of those are still in cultivation. Gene, is that Furman Lambeau, or is that a selfie? Of That's Furman Lambeau in the picture. Okay, because I recently had it in bloom, and my flowers are much fuller than that. Yeah. Well, it's a very large flower. I'm trying to think where that picture is. Um, That's right, because the yeah. Texas people are standing straight up, and yeah. uh, the other ones don't do that. Yeah. Do it could be the angle the picture was made. Uh, <laughs> it looks like the door changed. See, it wasn't 5000 it was 10 It's in the Boston Globe. It was what? It was $10,000. 10000 OK. Change it to 10 yeah, I'll change it to 10 can I change the other to 200 then? Yep. All right, these are some semi alba clones. I think the one on the left is the Bedford clone, and the one on the right is the one we've been talking about, the FMB, Frau Melanie Beirut. Uh, and we've, we've not had Bedford, but we do have the other one, Frau Melanie Beirut. And uh, I've used it uh, to remake Enid Alba. Uh, with the Mossy Ranikiana. But anyway, uh, uh, as I say here, they have thin texture and they don't usually last well. And so uh, it hasn't been used a whole lot. They're not used in the cut flower trade. But even in some of the other modern hybrids, you still see that they have good, good substance and they last well. But what they show from the Varshavitsi eye are those two big gold eyes in the lip. This is the Loris Ziegfeld Carruthers. Gene, could yeah. you go back uh, one photo, please? Question to the audience. Why do some Warsawisii have eyes, like the one on our left, and others have straight yellow under the lapella? Yeah, it's more usual to have the eyes. Uh, Jeff Bradley says that the blue forms, cerulean forms of Varshavitsi, I never have the eyes in the lip. Uh, so there are some that don't. Usually FMB has color all the way around the edges of the lip. Yeah. All the way up on the top. Yeah. This, is, this came from Chadwick. This is our blooming of one from Chadwick. Yeah. But that was one of the primitive ways to tell that that Yeah, I think maybe uh, the edges right there are turned back a little bit, so maybe you, you'd see more color. In fact, on the... It's the photographer. It's me. 
Oh, I'm going too far back, aren't I? I'm sorry. Wrong button. Ah. Uh, Okay, now we'll try this way and that. All right, Mendelia, you heard about yesterday, um, and um, you don't see that many of them in the collections. This is Carlos Arango, which is a well-known clone. Uh, I've selfed this, and the seedlings are growing very well, but we haven't started blooming them yet, but I'm anxious to bloom them. Uh, the lavender ones I have, Mendelia, the color is very weak, uh, and uh, they are not as floriferous as mossy, as I mentioned earlier, and they don't grow as well as mossy. And they, uh, the seedlings take much longer to bloom. These seedlings, uh, the selfing, is taking forever to get up to blooming size, whereas if, on the mosses, they start blooming real young. Especially if, if you have a flowering plant with Catlia mossy, you can cut off a single bulb, and it will bloom on the first growth. So uh, uh, it's amazing. The, and I've been told that when a cattleya blooms for the first time, there are hormones in the plant that cause it to bloom on smaller pieces. So that uh, uh, like with the tissue culture, with Americlones, if you buy a Americlone that's been taken from a mature plant, you know, uh, the Americlones would bloom on smaller plants than the seedlings from that same parent uh, because they have that hormone uh, that goes along with the flowering. Anyway, Mendelia has uh, not been used as much as many of the other species. This is Maxima in Peru. Maxima comes in various color forms. There's some, uh, I have some beautiful concolor Maximas that are pink, pure pink, and I have some beautiful Alba Maximas, and we talked yesterday Somebody mentioned that the lowland variety uh, is the one with the taller stem and a lot more blooms, whereas the, uh, the upper elevation varieties uh, have a shorter plant and, uh, and not as many blooms per stem. But you see Maxima in a lot of collections, and not as many hybrids from it. Usually has darker flowers. The, the, the higher elevation has the darker flowers, yeah. And this is Catlia rex from Peru. Uh, this is the Ayachuca form, which has rounder petals, and, uh, rounder leaves, rather, and is a more vigorous plant than the, uh, the older uh, types of rex. Uh, it's in the parentage of a lot of the early hybrids. It was used a lot in early days of hybridizing, not so much in more recent days. Now, a few hybrids. I'll do this real quickly because I'm running out of time. But these are uh, some hybrids. Most of these are Carter and Holmes hybrids. Uh, that, but all of them have the, uh, you can see Catlia triani. Of course, this one has Deviana in the background. But these two down here, these are large flowers. With, look at that big lip from triani, from some of the triani background. And uh, beautiful one there. These are pure Catlias. They don't have any uh, Deviana in the background. But uh, that one up there. This is a cross of Horace Maxima with George King Serendipity. And it's a cross that I made. Uh, it was made in Australia, and that's why it's named Dolls Grace. But I made it also, and this is an awarded one from that. Uh, it's got an AM from my cross. And then these beautiful yellows. Uh, this, you see the red around the column there? Frank Gilmore. That is definitely coming from the Dalyana. And uh, these, these are large flowers, about seven inches, beautiful concolor yellow on a plant that grows like a weed. Yeah, grows like a weed. And then this, you see Dalyana written all over the Susan Fender here. This is a Maryland Carter hybrid. But it's, it's still got the Bob Betts back there, so it, it's got good form. And then this is Colonel David Brooker which is a newer, one of the newer Oconee-derived hybrids. Uh, Brunswick Gem is a cross of Owen Holmes Mendenhall with Horace Maxima. 
and we have some uh, we have some nice red clones of this also. In fact, there's that's a redder clone. Uh, this is Sentinel's watermelon. It's a seedling that uh, Mark Werther flowered. Down here are two of the darker. In fact, this is probably our darkest and best overall of the real dark cat. It's a Cecil Barrier. This Edisto is Oconi by Maria Ozella, and then this is uh, this is uh, Oconi by Ralph Pacentia. And so this is Edisto crossed with uh, Cecil Barrier. I forget the other parent right now, but anyway, this is bred from Edisto, and these these two are two of our darkest and best. How, how big Very are, red. How big are they? Let me see, the Eagle Island's about six inches. Both of them are about six inches. They're not real big flowers. And then these are some more art shades. Uh, the Dickie Brooks, that's named for my son-in-law. Uh, that's uh, Sheen by Oconee. Another Susan Fender. This is my favorite of the Susan Fenders, uh, the Newberry clone. Uh, it grows extremely well, and it... It's always a gorgeous flower, and uh, this is uh, another. This is bred from Marilyn Carter too, been named David Dolge for my brother-in-law. And when this flowered, this is actually the first seedling that flowered of this cross. And uh, we flowered four in a tray. We grow ours in a seedling tray, and then we flowered four of these. And I asked that this be named for me. Uh, this is Oconee crossed with Maria Zella, which makes Edisto. And then uh, that crossed with Beaufort. And then that crossed with another cross that uh, has uh, sophronized coccinia as a parent. And uh, so it's several generations of our breeding. But uh, what I was working for, one of the parents of this has tribute, VLC tribute for a, a parent. Uh, no, Sandra, Murray Spencer's clone, Sandra. Tribute Sansa, Sandra. And uh, the other parent was the tetraploid coccinia. And then uh, crossed with the Oconee-derived uh, Newberry Delight was the other parent. And uh, so I was going for stem habit because most of the coccinia hybrids uh, uh, the blooms are gorgeous, but the stems are thin and wiry, and they come straight out and maybe hang down. And I was trying to get some that stood up. And on this cross here, the stems stand up. So, how tall is the plant? I mean, the plant itself, you got it about right. Eight inches. Eight inches, right about eight, eight to ten inches. And the blooms are about three and a half to four inches. I was going for form, color, and stem, and uh, we don't grow for the pot plant mar market, so I, I wasn't thinking of pot plant at all. We haven't made hybrids for pot plant culture. Well, that one will work. Yeah, that one would work. And it blooms more than once a year. A lot of these uh, coccinia hybrids, you know, will bloom several times a year. All right, let's see what else I got here. I don't think I have much. Uh, <laughs> Keith, you got any of this for sale yet? <laughs> Three years of Australian telephone conversation. Yeah. Uh, this is a cross made by Don Herman, and uh, he named it Yellow Ribbons, and it was flowered by a lady, a hobby grower in Australia by the name of Zelda Holm, and. Uh, she contacted us a number of years ago and, and said, would you be interested in uh, tissue culturing this for me? And so uh, we said, well, what we'd like to do is buy the plant and then let you have some of the clones back when we get it going. And so we did buy the plant and, uh, and this is a large flower. How large do you think it is? No, Keith is saying eight inches, and he's conservative, but it's a large flower. But anyway, uh, it's a pretty good grower, uh, but we have not been able to get it to multiply in the laboratory, so it has not been tissued yet. And uh, 
Keith became good friends with Zelda Holmes, so when our plant was sent over, she sent one for him also. And uh, Keith has done a better job of growing it. And he's bred with it. I haven't bred with it, but Keith has. And Zelda in Australia has bred with it, and she's also bloomed some of the first-generation hybrids, and she's getting some fantastic stuff out of it. Really, really beautiful, with wider petals and better form, you know, and still with the uh, flaring and the, the uh, different colors. So that's a glimpse of what might be coming down the line, and that is the end.